creating a culture of love. Today, only about 30% of American families eat together on a regular basis. Your twist and your flavor and your energy to it, but you're actually using data and science and making it really palatable. We have to understand and intelligently make culture shifts. That time when people just ate food, we were far healthier. Do we have to sit down at the table together or can we sit down at the coffee table or can we congregate in the kitchen? Is there a right way to do family time? And what does that look like now? They never considered that when they're looking at their patient's heart and their blood metrics, that they're looking at what their patient has eaten. John Stevenson, yes, you are one of the, I would say, so top health gurus, spitting game and knowledge around the fitness, wellness, and food space. Not only are you bringing your twist and your flavor and your energy to it, but you're actually using data and science and making it really palatable. And, you know, with the model health show and everything you're putting out there. So, as a guy who went to school for this stuff, I was going to be an orthopedic surgeon. Many people are like, what, you paint murals and you're doing this? I'm like, yeah, I'm an exercise science major, master in biomechanics, nutrition, all the things that were in there. Um, I just geek out over it. And yeah. health and wellness to me is such a pillar of living through love and a model of self-love and self-care. So I'm really excited to have you on. You have an amazing cookbook coming out. You bring a wealth of knowledge and... Thank you for being here. Oh, man, it's my pleasure. You know, it's a it's a absolute honor. And like you said, just e as soon as you said this, that connection between your your creative entity and love mm -hmm. and health, these things are really synonymous. Yeah. You know, it's very difficult. It's part of the research as well. It's, it's very difficult to express the full capacity of love mm -hmm. and empathy and compassion if we don't feel well. Yeah. We can. You know, love is ever present, mm -hmm. but it can be difficult difficult to express it or to grasp it, and most importantly, to maintain it, mm. right? Because love is a high frequency. Like, can oh, yeah. you vibrate at that frequency for a sustainable amount of time without crashing, mm -hmm. right? And so the cultivation of health is, like, really foundational in how we express ourselves, how we connect with other people. And that's really my mission, man. You know, I've been in this field. I just crossed my 20th anniversary of working in health and fitness. Amazing. Congrats. And I was just sharing with you, I met I met my wife actually in in college uh, back in St. Louis. And she, our first date, you know, every that's the thing about food as well. Like it's it's surrounding so much of our lives. Yeah. Right. So much of our lives are centered around food. First dates, graduations, mm -hmm. funerals. You mm -hmm. know, my father just passed away recently. Oh, I'm sorry. You know, um, soccer games right so that after the game you know um there's not really many things in our culture that doesn't involve food and we've kind of devolved in a sense in our relationship with that yeah right because outside of celebration and that connection with food a significant amount of our culture a significant amount of our population are now eating alone in isolation mm -hmm. which is something that had really never existed in a great capacity through human evolution mm -hmm. you know food was centered around cooperation it was centered around tribe mm -hmm. and today oftentimes and by the way here's just one of the stats where family meals was the cultural norm the, the majority of families in the United States, we're just talking about the U.S. for now, were eating together with their families on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. Today, and a lot of people are shocked to hear this, only about 30% of American families eat together on a regular basis. So it's something that is becoming on the endangered species list, essentially. That's interesting. And I'm working to revive that because, as we'll talk about today, there are phenomenal data driven i'm talking there are studies after studies affirming how eating together with friends and family is a huge protective mechanism against obesity against eating disorders mm. against chronic diseases of all sorts especially for children and so yeah man i'm excited about this 
Yeah, that's interesting. No, and thank you. And reading some of the, the stuff, you know, your research and what's going on and what you've been talking about, I didn't think about it that way. It is an endangered species, right? It's like, oh, that's that's we understand what that means. And I remember growing up, family meal time. I don't know what time it was, six o'clock or whatever. Like my mom would cook, sit down, we would eat move on with our day and do that like day in day out. I mostly vividly really experienced it on the weekends, but we don't do that now. We go out to eat a lot as a family, but like at home we're tired. I get home from working, wife's working, pick up the kid. We cook. I mean, by the time we sit there and do this, we're exhausted. So how can we revive this? Cause I know the power about it. We love like, Let's get a bunch of homies together. Let's do a sit down. Let's break bread. Like how we celebrated that birthday a couple months ago. That to me is everything. Like I want a huge property so I can get all my friends over and we just eat and be married together. All our kids, whatever. That to me is love. And we use food as a way of nurturing and sharing and spreading love as well. Not only by cooking it and sharing, but how it makes us feel. So what is it that we can start doing now as a family? Because the easy excuse is I'm too busy. I can't do this. I can't cook. Let's order in. And do we have to sit down at the table together or can we sit down at the coffee table or can we congregate in the kitchen? Is there a right way to do family time? And what does that look like now? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, it always starts with why, right? Why does this matter? Mm -hmm. And, you know, different people think in different terms. Some people just want to know the thing. And so, but I want to build a foundation on why first. Mm -hmm. All right. So the Journal of Nutrition, Education and Behavior published a really fascinating study and they were looking at the behavior of families eating together and their habitual consumption of different foods. Mm. Right. And so what they found was that when children eat together with their family and the, the number was four times a week. Predominantly, they were looking at breakfast because it's kind of everybody's getting ready for the day, mm -hmm. but it can be any meal. When they ate together four times a week, the children ate an astonishingly lower amount of chips and soda and a significantly higher amount of fruits and vegetables. Mm. All right. And the researchers went on to find that if the television was rarely on or not on at all during these family meals, it dropped their consumption of chips and soda, soda even further, so ultra-processed foods and beverages. Now, what was so powerful about that study to me personally was that this was looking at minority children who are generally in the construct of low-income neighborhoods, mm -hmm. right? And this is where I come from, right? So most of my adult years, actually, I lived in Ferguson, Missouri, Ferguson, Florissant, mm -hmm. you know, even when I was going to college, um, which is what's known as this, I don't like the term food desert because a yeah. desert sounds kind of cool. You know what I yeah, mean? Yeah. Like I see Jodeci like in the sand, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. But a food desert is, it, it is devoid really of opportunity mm. to find real food. Predominantly I'm having ultra processed food just pushed into my face at every turn. I don't mm -hmm. know really. I, I'm, I'm lacking the awareness that there's other, right? And so coming from that environment, you know, and also, you know, I lived all over St. Louis, but we also were on food stamps. We were on WIC, right? We had, uh, we were getting even food from charities at mm. some points. You know, my mom would actually sell her blood Damn. to buy food for us from time to time. And so, you know, if we're talking about a low income, living in poverty, that was us. And being in that, in that situation, we eat what we can, yeah. right? We eat what we have access to as well. And ultra processed foods, by their very nature, they're incredibly tasty. They're created by food scientists. They're engineered and, for your tongue to just have an orgasm. <laughs> dude, I can break down the science and how it works, you know, and vanish, vanishing caloric density and all these different things. But they're crafting these foods. I'll just throw in one little nugget. There was this invention called a gas chromatograph where they can identify certain flavors. Because flavor is just chemistry. Yeah. Everything in life is chemistry. Yeah. Love is chemistry, mm -hmm. you know. And so they can identify these certain flavors and then basically just recreate that flavor synthetically. And so that's when we have strawberry flavor was no longer relegated to strawberries, mm. right? You could take that strawberry flavor and add it to Pop juice, <laughs> Pop-Tarts, yeah. soda, you know, right? It might not taste exactly the same, but it's just enough mm -hmm. to muddy up the metabolic waters, right? 
And so, you know, these foods by their nature, very, very tasty, very addictive, and also very cheap, right? Yeah. So this is getting into like conversations of economies of scale and this, this and that. But the bottom line is they tend to be very inexpensive. And with this being the case, this is going to be the thing that we naturally go to. Now, with that said, had we known as a family that we could create a buffer from me, I'm growing up with chronic asthma, my little brother, extremely bad asthma. Mm -hmm. I was hospitalized maybe once a year. He's hospitalized multiple times a year. Damn. My little sister having eczema, my mother being obese, my father obesity, my mother diabetes, grandparents, heart disease. Everybody had something. Yeah. Okay. And ultimately, I was diagnosed when I was 20 with degenerative bone and disc disease where my spine was deteriorating. Yeah. Right. And so we could have created a buffer against these health conditions had we known that simply eating together as a family more often could reduce our risk of chronic illnesses. And I'll get to that in just one moment. But we didn't know. You know, it's just not, it wasn't apparent to us. So most of the time when we ate, it was grab and scatter you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying a lot of times in front of the tv or the video game and being that we had this growing phenomenon where both parents are rarely ever there right so one's working and one's kind of taking care of the kids yeah i can count on my hands the number of times my family ate together okay i can count on my hands outside of holiday okay just to be clear Right. So the, the big holidays, Thanksgiving, whatever. Yeah, those don't count. That's a little bit different. So. Yeah. So most of the time the kids are eating by ourselves or with one parent mm -hmm. sometimes. But usually we're not eating all together in the same space. We're eating at the same time. Right. And with this being the case and knowing that we, I come from a low income environment. Mm -hmm. Had we known that we can add this piece in where we sit down and eat together, because what that does, so here's some of the reasons why it's so effective, is that it brings about a level of intention. Mm. It brings about a level of planning and structure, like you know you're going to be sitting down to eat together. Mm -hmm. This doesn't mean you're not going to sometimes sit down and eat fast food, but it's just bringing about a culture where we're eating together as a family, and that just brings about more opportunity to, to, to make real food, to actually cook. Mm -hmm. And so I want to share one more why, and I could just, we can do this part all day. No, I one, can tell. <laughs> <laughs> one more why, and this research was published in the journal Pediatrics and a couple other places. But what the researchers uncovered was that children who eat together with their family at least three times a week had dramatically lower incidences of metabolic syndrome, obesity, and disordered eating. Mm. All right. And all of these things have skyrocketed in children. All right. For folks that don't know, childhood obesity has tripled in the last 30 years. It's tripled in the yeah, last that, 30 that's years. That's something, I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but that is something that boils my blood. And it's really easy to point fingers on certain things. Some of us have education or not. And I want you to go back into that. But like, I go as far as saying that I believe that's child abuse because a lot of what the kids are eating and being fed come from the parent. I'm not talking about socioeconomic status or any of that or education, yeah. but like it starts there. So like, let's start combating that because the kid doesn't choose it at first. Yeah. It gets addicted to it later, but at first it's what you're feeding your child. Yeah. So like, it's cultural. Yeah. It's, a, it's a cultural construct. And that's the thing that we all need to wake up to is that we think we're making our decisions. We think that we're thinking from free will. Mm. But we're making choices based on our culture. Mm -hmm. And our culture is kind of like an invisible hand or invisible guidance system or even an invisible box that we're operating in and making our choices from that. And so, so often we're trying to change the food behaviors and habits without addressing the underlying culture. Yeah. And so it's kind of like treating a symptom of a disease without addressing the root cause. Right. And so yeah. this is why we tend to fall back into disordered eating. And just to even affirm what you just said with the abuse title. Now, this is really important is because so often, and there's a statement that is popular, but if we just take a moment to really understand this, that hurt people hurt people. Mm, yes. Right. And so a lot of times when we're inflicting abuse, we're doing it unconsciously. We don't know that we're doing it. Right. So my parents weren't thinking about the 
mental constructs or the struggles that I would have later on based on conversations, based on certain things they said to me, based yeah. on certain conditions they put me in, right? They were just living life and doing the best that they could with the knowledge that they had, yeah. right? And so we can haphazardly be inflicting abuse on our children because of the cultural container. Yeah. But being aware of the abuse and and being somebody who's wanting to create the best opportunity for our families, for our communities, like this is the time to take control of this. And so, you know, with that said, how do we get over the last 30 years a tripling of childhood obesity? Something that was really rare. And if you, everybody just thinks about this, even when we were in school, there might be like one maybe two kids that were overweight mm -hmm. in our class. That you know, truly had some kind of an issue because even now adults are like, oh, I have a thyroid problem. Chalk it up to that. Or I have this or I have that. And 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 I see that. And I'm thinking back in my childhood, there was a point when I was five, I cut my foot from the arch all the way to the toe. I was bedridden for five months. My parents fed me really good food, Cuban food. Loved it. It was so yeah. good. This spot called Las Palmas. I got chunky. So when I got, when I was, I was a skinny little kid until I got chunky. Yeah. And I remember for a couple of years, I'm like, oh, I'm the chunky kid. Mm. Like, yo. And it's just, that was a lack of movement, still eating. It wasn't that it was not quality food. But besides that, and the reason why I remember it so vividly, I couldn't say, look, there's a bunch of other chunky kids out here with me. Mm. I was wow. the chunky kid because I got hurt. Yeah. Now, though, you see, it's more like, oh, I'm one of the skinny kids around. Mm, wow. Yeah, it's it's flipped. Mm -hmm. You know, wow, that's powerful, man. You know, it just also I gathered up uh, from Billy Madison when he's like the smelly kid in class. Or yeah. whatever. <laughs> oh, was that Big Daddy? He's like, my kid's a smelly kid in class. Yeah. So, yeah, man, it's, it's such an interesting phenomenon. But we've got to understand this isn't about vanity. This is not Correct. about a vanity, yeah. vanity metric. This is about dramatically increasing the risk of chronic and infectious mm -hmm. disease and mental health conditions for our children, for ourselves, when we're venturing into this state, this yeah. metabolic state, right? So this is a state where, you know, if we're venturing into obesity, our fat cells are really amazing, by mm -hmm. the way. They've evolved. Part of the reason that we've become the apex uh, species, or apex predator, if you will, and on the planet is our ability to utilize fuel sources to store energy mm -hmm. and to be creative in the procurement of energy. And so our fat cells really helped us to survive and survive in different climates and terrains. Mm -hmm. They're very intelligent, like, but we are at war with our fat cells now. Yep. We don't understand that they're just doing what they've evolved to do, which is to store energy essentially for when we need it. But mm -hmm. oftentimes today, we never get a chance to need it. Yep. Right, because we're so inundated with ultra processed foods at every turn, at every turn, and creating dysfunction with how quickly those fat cells are getting filled up. Now, here's the crazy part: you, our fat cells can actually expand their volume nearly a thousand times their size. Wow! There's nothing else that can do something like that. I mean, think about it, a thousand times. That is, it's outrageous. It's outrageous. It's outrageous, it, and it's it's really, it's also again just very sobering to think about because also we we might think that we're creating a lot of new fat cells mm -hmm. a lot of the fat cells that we have we're born with mm -hmm. we're losing fat cells are dying off but they're getting replaced mm -hmm. kind of like a one-to-one -one situation there are situations where you can stir about lipogenesis the creation of mm -hmm. new fat but that's a whole different conversation to get into most of the time what's happening when we see the outer expression of obesity or gaining excessive weight is our fat cells, the volume, their contents are expanding and filling up, Yeah. right? And so the underlying factor that makes obesity so dangerous is that when those fat cells are expanding, especially beyond the volume that we've evolved with, it's setting off an immune response, mm. all right? The fat cells are essentially acting as though they're infected. Mm -hmm. And so it's creating inflammation. Now, this word has been used a lot recently. Oh, it comes yeah. from, you know, Latin roots, meaning basically to, to set a f on fire, right? Mm -hmm. Something is ablaze. And inflammation, in many ways, it is kind of an internal fire happening. But what it's doing is just drawing in energy, drawing in the immune cells, because we need inflammation to survive. Yep. All right? If Without inflammation, we're not going to heal. Mm -hmm. We're not going to grow. But, so we need inflammation for repair. And when inflammation goes too far, 
right? When we get into the state of chronic inflammation, that's where the problem is. And so, you know, to put a bow on this, so this is the reason that we become more susceptible to infectious diseases once we venture into obesity. Mm -hmm. We become more susceptible to heart attacks and strokes. We already have an underlying state of high inflammation, yeah. chronic inflammation. And you just add an insult on top of it, something bad can happen at any point, more likely. Yeah. And so it's a catalyst. Yeah. Plus the pressure it's building inside of the cavities before it expands. You could only expand so far. So you just start seeing this whole ripple effect. Yeah. And it's really what it is, is an adaptation. Mm -hmm. Your body's adapting to process and to keep you alive mm -hmm. under unideal circumstances. And that's where we should give, give a shout out to our bodies. Our yeah. bodies are geniuses. Right. And yeah. all of us are walking chemistry experiments. So what works for you doesn't work for me and vice versa. Like they are really smart and they're trying to keep us alive. We're the ones trying to kill ourselves and sometimes don't even realize it yeah. or don't care. Because yeah. of culture. Yeah. You know? And that's we, that don't care part is a, really a state of learned helplessness. Mm -hmm. And I would see this in my clinical practice a lot, um, you know, where people had a story, you know, that they've tried everything. And a lot of times when I ask people, like, how many things they try, it'd be like two things. Yeah. Maybe three. You know what I mean? Like, I've tried everything. So, but here's the, the, the bottom line with all this and just to tie it all together. So this increase in obesity, not being a vanity metric, but a matter of health and a matter of resilience, mm -hmm. a matter of safety, defense against chronic diseases, infectious diseases, that increase coincided with a skyrocketing consumption of ultra processed foods. All right. So according to the BMJ, British Medical Journal, one of the most prestigious journals in the world, mm -hmm. they published a report recently stating that American adults now consume about 60% of the American diet is ultra processed foods. Mm -hmm. That's shocking. 60%, the majority of our diet is fake foods. All right. Now, here's where my new project and what I'm really out here working to educate people on, a, a new study published in JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association, looked at the trends in consumption, food consumption by children and adolescents, mm. okay? And they found that today, the average child's diet is made of nearly 70% ultra processed foods. It's 67.1 or 0.3%. It's, it's just outrageous what's happening with our children but also just i'm just thinking in the future the habit to break that the addiction i mean by that point it's written in your dna like yeah. you can have withdrawals if you don't eat this like that's mind-blowing yeah yeah we can talk about the addictive factor the psychological emotional mental faculty and also this really important concept of something called recidivism where once we gain this weight or create this metabolic abnormality, it's hard, especially when we do it as a child, it's harder to reverse it later mm -hmm. on, right? And so we see this, again, th these are things we can just look around and see. You know, if we're struggling with these things as a kid, we're going to tend to bring that with us. Oh, yeah. And even as adults, you know, if we don't really take control of our health, it becomes more and more difficult as we move on in age. It doesn't have to be. Correct. But culturally, that's what we see because there are people out here who are transforming their health at 60, mm -hmm. at 70. You know, like it's really never too, if your heart is still beating, progress can be made. No, for know? sure. And so, but the, the mission is really to get folks educated about the current situation because this is, and by the way, a huge caveat for this episode is that this is nowhere in any form or fashion about perfection. Yes. It's about progress. It's about stacking conditions in your favor because your kids, they're going to be out here. They're going to be doing stuff, you know? So, you know, my son's at basketball camp today and they're providing the lunch. Yeah. All right. And I've been, he'd been taking his lunch all week, but I'm just like, you can go ahead and you don't do the thing today. And he had a real food breakfast that I made for him today before mm -hmm. he left out. And for dinner, very likely we're going to eat together as a family. Like I'm stacking conditions so that the majority of the time he's eating real food. Yeah. And so I just came in yesterday. He had a basketball practice and we've been out of town for like two weeks. And so we just got back and I'm telling you like five parents, the coach came up to me. As soon as I saw the coach, he's like, your son grew. 
Your son, <laughs> it's been two weeks. This yeah. kid is like, he's the biggest kid, tallest kid um, in, on his team. And it's just like, what in the, all of these like regenerative anabolic things mm -hmm. are getting expressed. Of course he sleeps well. When I was sleeping as a kid, I'm sleeping in like, there's gunshots, no bullshit. There's gunshots outside. There's there's the you know the the yeah, um, so you're sirens all, you're going on. You're elevated off. on like not alert. to mention what's happening in my household. You yeah. know, I never know what can pop off. You know, violence. You know, whatever fights, and so I kind of had to sleep with one eye open. You know, and so what do you think's gonna happen to me? You know, I'm gonna degenerate. I'm gonna break mm -hmm. down prematurely, and that's what happened. No kid. I was 20 years old when I got diagnosed with an arthritic condition. No, I know. And just from what I studied, like, even if you're active, that's, that's, that shouldn't be happening. Yeah. Like, yeah. it shouldn't be. No, it shouldn't. Because I had that piece dialed in, you know, I was at the top of my game, you know, I ran a four or five when I was 15. You there know? you go. And, and I've got game film at my house right now of me breaking away, like I was on like a 39 sweep or something, get past the safety. Mm -hmm. And then I'm a kid and I tear a muscle and I end up falling. Right. Nobody touched me. Yeah. My body just started breaking down. You know, it was that blade of grass. <laughs> and the blade of grass. <laughs> I am Groot got me, you know, no, it's so but... crazy, you know. But again, had I known that this mattered and this is what I've you know, I've spoke to many kids over the years going into schools and whatnot. And it's just about tying. It's tying change to something that matters to us mm -hmm. and not trying to force change on people, because, again, we get very comfortable with the way that our culture is set up. Even if we're not happy about our bodies yeah. or our health, we're comfortable with it in a strange way. And so we're coming in trying to force change because what I noticed when I was working with all those people in my in my practice all those years is that people want change, but they don't want to change that much. Exactly. Right? They want change, but they don't want to change that much. And that's the truth. And the second factor to that is they don't want to do the work. They want to find the pill. And I'm going to interject with this right now because I think, for what I think, it's gone viral. Ozepic? Man, okay, you want to crack this open? You want to crack <laughs> it open? Let's crack it open. Like, come on. It's interesting because um, <laughs> let's just say, I, I can't name the names, but there's an entire office. They're all on it. And if you look at what they eat, it's, it's just... I just encourage people to look at the black box warning from the FDA on it, on the product. And it's not cheap. How are they getting money to do the pay a trainer? Listen, listen. I encourage people to look at the black box warning on this medication from the FDA stating that this, this drug has been found to create thyroid cancer in laboratory animals. All right? Not humans. That's not proven. <laughs> It's, it's not known, and that's the, the language that they'll use in the black box warning. It's unknown if mm -hmm. this is dangerous to humans, but guess what? And if you think about it, even in targeting the thyroid in laboratory animals, our thyroid is really a, a major hub of our metabolism. It has yeah. a lot to do with our, with our metabolic rate, how our body's processing energy, and it also, your thyroid is really existing a, along something called the HPA axis, which a lot of people have, have heard about, you know, from science class, but it's the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. Mm -hmm. It's like this information superhighway. Your thyroid is along that superhighway. And in direct communication is your hypothalamus and your pituitary, all right? And they're even feeding out, like there's a communication with, you know, uh, TSH, you know, your thyroid stimulating mm -hmm. hormone, mm -hmm. and T4 and all this, you know, reverse T3, all this stuff. There, that's the communication with it your brain. It all and has to work together for it to work. Now, here's where it gets crazy. So, <laughs> researchers at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine found that once we start to gain excessive weight, I really want people to get this, this is very important. What they found was that once we start to gain excessive amounts of weight, carrying specifically more excess belly fat and venturing into obesity, it's creating more inflammation in our brain. Mm. Our brain is feeling the result of that, the insult, because there's a chronic inflammation in the body. So and is that the increasing brain fog that's happening? And all manner of symptoms. It's going to depend on the person, but here's this is the most important point of this. So excessive body fat creates inflammation in the brain, and inflammation in the brain was leading to excessive buildup of body fat and <laughs> insulin resistance. Yes, <laughs> so it becomes itself. a vicious circle, Oof. all right? And 
again, we come in and try and do like a point system or some diet foods or whatever and not understanding like we've got to break this chain. We've got to break this pattern of inflammation. Mm -hmm. What nutrition program is telling people we need to address the inflammation in your brain in order to get you healthy? And why isn't this more of a popular part of the conversation? It's growing now. All right. Part of this is because the brain is very, it's so beautiful. Um, Michio Kaku is kind of like a modern day Einstein. A lot of people would refer to him as he said that the human brain is the most complicated object in the known universe. Mm -hmm. All right. And we have one of them, right? It's so powerful, but we don't necessarily know how to use it very well, no. you know? Yeah. And this organ is very, very protective, right? So it's hard to understand. It's hard to, to, to track and to study. And there, of course, we've had some advances in the last couple of years, but nothing is really dialed in on what's happening in the brain. Mm -hmm. The brain is the only organ that's fully encased in hard bone, right? So it's got like a built-in helmet. Mm -hmm. And also, our brain is very ravenous. So part of the metabolism, food consumption equation that mm -hmm. goes with the brain is that even though the brain is only about 2% of our body's mass, it's consuming upwards of like 25 to 30% of the calories we eat. Yeah. Right. Have you read Sapiens? I have not, no. So I read, just to interject on that one moment, mm. he basically writes this book. It's a, it's a huge book about the evolution of man and, and homopods and everything. And like there was a few different homopods out in the world. And certain of them have bigger brains, smaller brains. And he's kind of ending up on how our brain size ended up being our size. And some of the other Neanderthals and other, you know, bipeds had way bigger brains and they didn't last. It wasn't about intelligence. It was about how much food your brain consumed and the lack of food that was out in the world for you to consume to keep yourself alive. Yeah, yeah. So that was interesting. Yeah. Uh, evolution just by... Right. And that part brings in that conversation of like, how did humans devise these ways to extract even more from the environment and also to become very crafty and thrifty at consuming, mm -hmm. like absorbing calories and storing them. Right. This is what our competitive advantage was. Mm. Right. And so, you know, the advent of cooking helped in many ways. And, you know, then we can get into conversations about agriculture and whatnot. Mm. I mean, there's like a double edged sword yeah. with some of this stuff. But the bottom line is that, you know, with the brain consuming so much of this energy, it's a hot spot for metabolic dysfunctions to take place. Now, we do have a guard system, kind of like an internal security system for the brain, the mm -hmm. blood brain barrier. Now my friends and college, like I just did a talk for the neuroscience department at NYU recently. All right. So my friends and colleagues are the top people in their game, you yeah. know, whether it's Wendy Suzuki at NYU, also Dr. Lisa Moscone is another really good friend. Uh, Dr. Daniel Amen. That's my guy. He wrote the forward. I'm sorry. He wrote the opening quote for, for my book. Oh, We're man. always going, man, I love these guys. All yeah. right. And oh, Dr. Caroline Leaf, I can go on and on. So what these researchers have really come to understand is that our brain is incredibly protective, but yet susceptible to insults. And when I was talking about the metabolic dysfunction, this is to bring it all full circle, the specific part of the brain that's getting harmed when we are gaining body fat or creating dysfunction, let me say creating dysfunction, is the hypothalamus. Mm -hmm. So it's hypothalamic inflammation, not just neural inflammation, hypothalamic inflammation. And so what that part of the brain is, is really kind of like an inter internal thermostat. So it's like determining, and this is what's also cool, and there's researchers at Yale found this out, is that your brain can inform your gut. Basically, there's information going back and forth. The vagus nerve is a big part of this. And based on your brain's assessment of what your gut is saying about your nutrition needs, your brain could down-regulate the absorption of calories from the food that you're eating. Your brain could tell your gut to lower the amount that you're absorbing of nutrients wow. and quote, caloric energy, right? So again, the calories in, calories out model, I mean, it's, it's, it's very rudimentary. There's a part to play with it, but there are epicaloric controllers that determine what your body's actually absorbing from the food I, that you're honest, eating. I've never knew that. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, yeah. And so, but also the other side, it can increase the absorption of calories based on the assessment of what you need. So we can be in a state of obesity, but still be starving, right? So our bodies can be starving of 
essential nutrients that your body needs to maybe, again, help to heal some kind of brain tissue, to build new neurons in, in your hippocampus, to clot your blood, whatever the case might be. And so your biological thrust is to eat more food. Mm -hmm. You need to get these nutrients in. Even though we have so much stored, right? So this is the irony that we're in today. And so, again, breaking that chain for our families, and that's what we can get into now, is going to take a cultural shift. And so that's what, you know, your initial question was, you know, so how do we do this? And so that's what I want to dive into, of course. Yeah, no, to recap all that, like, again, guys, I'm a, I'm a nerd when it comes to this. Like, I studied it. So right now, I'm loving this conversation. So thank you for sharing this, because we don't hear any of this out there, right? In my head, half the stuff I'm saying is like, why don't we know this? Why don't we know this? And some of us that have studied it, we still don't know this. And you're saying one simple solution for all of this is just eat with your family. Mm. And that's yeah. choosing love. And that's choosing love. Like, that's kind of like a, a mind blow emoji right now. That's what's happening here. So, and, and that down regulation, that's also playing into homeostasis, right? Yes. This is yeah. why you run hot or cold or this or that. Like, I mean, this whole vicious cycle of it going together. So that's the why. Yeah. You know, you just said a couple of key words, you know, um, even with the, the down regulation and homeostasis, we're talking about shifts in your chemistry. We're mm -hmm. talking about shifts in your biology. So your brain is literally shifting over from this fight or flight sympathetic on mm -hmm. system to the parasympathetic rest and digest is the nickname part of your nervous system. Yeah. And so one of the studies that I reference in the Eat Smarter Cookbook is a study that was conducted with office workers at IBM, right? And so they found that if the employees were able to just get home and have dinner with their families, it created this really remarkable, number one, increase in their work output and their performance at work and dr dr dropping down burnout. Mm -hmm. But what it was really was reducing their stress levels. So making it home for dinner was a buffer against chronic stress. And what they found was that as more workload came on and they were less able to eat with their families, their dissatisfaction with work continued to increase, right? And so there's, again, something about sitting down with the people that you love. You know, uh, the, the dinner table is a unifier. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and I just want to also, again, remind people, it doesn't matter if it's dinner. It could be lunch. It could be breakfast. Mm -hmm. But I'm on a mission to for everybody to take on this mandate that you have three meals a week with your family. The data finds that that number, that's really the sweet spot. And it could be any of the meals, just three times a week, sitting down and eating with your family. And now the question is, how do we go about making this happen in our world today? Well, a couple of simple things that, that we could do. And just understanding that a lot of us spend time We've devolved from eating together. Do you remember being bored as a kid? Like, no. do you remember? Just being bored as a kid? Yes, just being bored. I couldn't tell you that I can actually pick a memory of just being bored. But you knew it existed. Oh, yeah. Because you know? we would call people boring. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but I don't remember myself physically being bored. Of course, we're not going to remember those moments of boredom. We're going to remember the moments of joy and revelation mm -hmm, and sadness mm -hmm. and all these things. But you had time to be bored. Yeah. Right. And then with that boredom would bring about creative ideas. And that's the thing about you. Even posing you that question, I knew I was like, this is gonna lead into some creative shit. <laughs> because you're going to create a way to feed that that space mm -hmm. because that boredom is an opportunity, right? Today, a lot of people, especially our children, never really have moments of boredom. They're constantly having a screen in their face. Mm. Right? So the reframe of you're really saying. Do you remember moments of stillness, moments of quiet, moments of non-distraction? That's how that's how I'm hearing it, right? Like now it's like screen time for the kid, wherever it's at, screen time. Like yeah. we regulate screen time accordingly. And it's definitely not when he's in emotional disarray or or whatever. So uh-huh, that makes sense. Cause I seek it. Yeah. I yeah. seek that time. Deep is deep work as well you know it's a great book um but my son you know we've been on a bit of a tear you know with travel and you know he spent 
of course, like he's got summer camps and basketball and whatnot, but he's been spending more time than usual prior to the last two weeks on his iPad, you know, gaming and, you know, maybe watching cartoons and things like that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we had a lot on our shoulders, you know, again, my father was on life support and like, it was a lot going on. Mm -hmm. And we took some time off and all of us just hung out together for a week, right? And while we were having dinner one day, my youngest son, who's 11, you know, we were just all talking. He's like, yeah, I feel like my life is moving really fast. Mm. And I was like, say more, like in my head. Mm -hmm. And he said it. Once he had the space, he realized that him being on these devices and not really being present in his environment made him feel like his time was speeding up. Ooh. He's a kid. Like I know us as adults, we tend to think that time is moving faster, right? But as a child, for him to catch that and for me to catch it as well, like, oh, no, wow, for sure. like he's feeling that's a stressor, right? Everything is feeling constricted. And so proactively creating a space. Now, I'm saying all this to say that we're addicted to these oh, things, yeah. you know, we we got to call it out. That's the first Dude, step. I mean, I'll say it myself. I, I pull out my phone for no. I'm like, nothing happened. Nothing happened. <laughs> Why? <laughs> I don't know. It's like. What is wrong with me? I go walk the dog. I pull it out three times. What? Mm, yeah. And, and it's, I don't even care it's what's on it. It's a safe space, it. man. You yeah. share it. Yes. No, for sure. <laughs> and, and I don't even care what's on it. I'm not searching yeah. for any. I don't think maybe subconsciously. Yeah. I think we've. it's all the physical habits. I'm a physical hands yeah. guy. So to yeah. me, it's like, oh, this is there's the physicality for something. But then if something does happen, boom, the brain trigger, the dopamine hit, the, yeah. th you know. The reward. Uh, yeah, exactly. So. What's said is that neurons that fire together wire together. So like you said, with the movements, even if you put your app, you know, for your social media, whatever, Instagram on the, one of your back screens, you got to swipe. You'll pick up your phone, swipe, 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 and you'll get to it. Like, I'll just <laughs> let me try and like put it somewhere where I'm not going to. You'll create the muscle memory, the, mm. the motor memory to just go right to that thing. Yeah. And what's happening again is that we have really brilliant engineers who are creating systems that you know, just understanding how the human brain works and our nervous system and understand that every one of our thoughts even is creating chemistry in our mm -hmm. bodies. And so even our thought and our perspective about these things and like, what if a big driving force of humanity that's helped us to evolve is something called instinctive elaboration, right? So it's kind of like questioning, an internal question. Instinctive elaboration. Yeah. And so we're always driven to find the answer to things. Yeah. Okay. Curiosity. Yes. We're innately curious, right? Now this can be used intelligently and I don't want to label good and not so good or evil, yeah. but if you're not aware of this, because we're, we're going to be driven to seek things out. Now with this instinctive elaboration, our drive to seek things out, like for a good example is, uh, we're living at like the golden age of television now. Right. Mm -hmm. And these writers and producers, they're using, open loops to keep you going to the next episode. Yeah. Right. Like I got to know what happened. What happened to Shirley? Yeah. Right. I don't know why I said Shirley, but, uh, that was from Martin. It was a uh, Cole's girlfriend. I think <laughs> big Shirley. Um, but you know, we have to find out what happened. We need to close the loop. We need to know. Yeah. And so what's so fascinating about social media is that we're driven there. People think that dopamine is like this kind of, you know, thing that makes us do the thing, but it's not like that. There's a cocktail of neurochemistry that's driving us to do that. And there's a, let me, let me put it like this. There's even an agitation, all right? There's even like norepinephrine and, and mm -hmm. epinephrine or adrenaline, noradrenaline. There's things that drive us to pick up our phones. And also we seek solace in the phones as well. There's a partial re relaxing mechanism we're finding a relief right how often do we work and then we're like i need to take a break and we pick our phone up mm -hmm. right and so it's like a relief from what we're doing yeah but it's not restorative there's a difference between relief and restoration it's like uh taking one fire hose for another mm. nothing really happens yeah. in between that's different yeah you're still getting blasted yeah yeah and different parts of your brain are going to be incredibly active, consuming because we're in this 
when you pick up that phone, you leave the present. You leave reality. You're now in, dare I say, the matrix. You're now in this <laughs> other reality. Yeah. And, you know, you've seen this where people can be doing this thing and trying to have a conversation to talk with you. And they're, they, you can't do that. You know, you're not really there and present. And so. On both sides, though. Yeah, of course. Of course. And now, so to, to tie all this together, when we're picking up our phone, right? So what happens is something called just checks, right? So I'll just check real quick. I'll just check. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? And it becomes like a part of that muscle memory, right? And this chemistry that's bubbling up, like it's kind of like a withdrawal if we're not on it for a while. And we need a hit. So we'll just check, right? And if we just check and then we find some shit, that's when dopamine happens. Mm. That's what anchors it in that when you check occasionally, you're going to get something that you like. And even from a lower, if we just want to talk about, you know, a lower version of this or a repetitive kind of version where you have this stress build up and even just swiping, the action of swiping, because we're drawn to seek things out mm -hmm. as humans, every time we seek something, we're get, it's like, a oh, this is the, the big one I want to share with people is the opioid system in our bodies mm -hmm. is getting triggered. All right. So it's like a painful uh, it's like it's like a, a pain that is getting um, is getting a treatment. Essentially, it's kind of like I have this pain or this uncomfortability because I'm not doing the thing. And now I'm getting the pleasure. I'm getting the 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 thing that takes the pain away. Now, we might not label it as pain, the but blocker, the yeah, whatever. Yeah, but it's driving it us to do sense. the behavior. And so now we're getting a hit from the opioid system. We're getting the dopamine because every time we seek something, we're drawn to seek. We find something every fucking time we swipe. Mm -hmm. We seek, find, seek, find. And every time we're doing that, we're building that neural network and mm -hmm. making it stronger. This is all laying this foundation to say that, listen, this is not easy to, if your kids, if yourself, you're used to being on your device while eating and now you're like, okay, that's it. We're eating together as a family. Yeah. This guy on the, you know, these two handsome guys was talking. I want to be more handsome. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. You can't do that. Yeah. We have to understand and intelligently make culture shifts. But I do want to be clear as parents, for me, and just being able to work with so many people over the years, we have to understand that being a parent in our world today, we don't want to seek democracy at this point. Mm -mm. You know, it needs to be a little bit more of a monarchy, a little bit more of, you know, uh, um, a system of uh, dictatorship. All right. With a benevolent dictator. Mm -hmm. Right. Who's like loving and listening to the people taking it. Yeah. In. Don't come from fear. Right. Yeah, come from love. Part, and if you're right. coming from love, the intentions there. But like you are the authority. You're the apex of the family. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and, and, and it's a balance. Bro, you just said it. You just said it. You know, it's like it's embracing that because we have also shifted into a culture that is really catering to the child and what the child wants. But with that said, the child doesn't really know what they want because yeah. they've so been so inundated with all of these messages and devices and cultural influence that they don't even really know who they are and what they yeah. what they want. So Understanding your power, like you are the parent and being able to make some firm decisions with love, with grace, finding some grace in this. Mm -hmm. And what I like to do and some of the strategies that I talk about in the book is inviting kids into the plan. Mm. Right. And so, for example, um, if you're choosing, we'll just say even a meal option. Right. And you like we're going to we're going to eat together as a family. Do you guys want to have blank or blank? Mm, yeah. Right. So instead of we just, we're eating together as a family, that's final. Like we just throw out the options. Mm. I'm like, you probably know what your kids like at this point, by the way, yeah. you know, and just like give those options. Like, oh yeah, we, we want, you know, whatever. We want the, the, we want the sweet potato casserole or whatever it is, mm -hmm. you know, like, so give them, invite them into the process of building the culture. Also, you can ask them, for example, like, Okay, so we're gonna have fam we're having family dinner on Wednesday nights. What do we want to do afterwards, right? Are we going to, you know, like, and this is the part where you get to start to intentionally create your family's culture, mm. right? And so, true story. A lot of times, 
after dinner for whatever reason. I don't know how to start it. We'll have a rap battle, you know. Sometimes some dancing competitions will break out. Like it's so, it's it's just wild, you know. Let's but spit this some is, bars at the end of this, bro. It's whatever, <laughs> okay. But you know, it's just like it's kind of built into mm -hmm. the fabric of our family, right? And there's so many great resources and tools. There's also like cards that you can get that have a family question that mm. you can use at the dinner table, and everybody kind of goes around and answers the question. Like if you had if if you could have one superpower, what would it be and why, right? And so just like these conversation pieces, because again, unfortunately, we've been pulled away from each other. We're constantly consuming. Sometimes our kids don't get a chance to process things and to share their perspective mm -hmm. and their thoughts with the people who matter most. And so these are just a couple of things. There are many, many more to start to cultivate and invite mm -hmm. everybody in together to eat together more frequently. Yeah, no, and it's and it's easy. It's more of a habit, and just saying that we ask, we're like, we're gonna cook dinner. What do you want? And like the protein's kind of what we pick, but we're like, do you want zucchini or corn? He's like zucchini, zucchini. I'm like okay, he's like corn, corn. <laughs> he's like, no, I want sprinkles. And like we're not gonna eat sprinkles right now. We'll have those after. <laughs> So we're, we're kind of in integrating him in that, or yeah. he likes, we got him a little stool thing, so yeah. he's up on the counter with mommy or daddy as we're trying to cut things and stuff, and, and going from there. But I like the addition of what you added, because sometimes we're really good at starting things, right? We, as humans, we can start, we could always start a new training plan, a new nutrition plan, a new, th it's staying consistent and finishing through or stacking onto it. So what's that secondary thing? And the, the aha moment you just gave me is like, what do you do after dinner? Start creating the culture of your family. And it, one day he's going to be old enough where it's homework and it, they eat, then they're going to go to the room and do homework. Like, no, let's have that moment. So like, I'm going to take that back. That's huge. Yeah. yeah. And also, again, we have to abandon, abandon our victim story yeah. as well. Like, this is all impressed upon me. I can't. I can't change the structure with my kid and their homework. Or, mm -hmm. You are so powerful. You know, we just create stories that make us comfortable, you know, but you can literally start writing a new chapter for your family starting today and create a new history for your family, right? You're, we're writing what will be history mm -hmm. right now. But so much of what we're doing is unconscious, right? It's just like life is just happening. And next thing you know, so much has passed by and we missed out on the things that matter most, Yeah, right? And so another thing, like you just mentioned, so that's so awesome that you just mentioned that, bringing our kids into the process of food preparation. So I share a really shocking statistic in the book as well about mm -hmm. how few kids in these recent generations actually know how to cook for themselves. Mm. All right, this is another thing on the endangered species list. Not even being able to prepare a meal of real food for themselves. Guess what they're gonna do? They're going to eat ultra processed foods. Yeah. And also I think this is a good point to clarify what is ultra processed foods. So humans have been processing foods forever, right? But there's a difference between a processing a food, like taking olives and crushing them, mm -hmm. cold press and making olive oil, or tomatoes and making spaghetti sauce. Mm -hmm. Or curing meats. Right, curing meats, the list goes on and on. You can still tell, tell where the food came from versus Twix. Right, serious, straight up. What the fuck is Twix made of? I have no like, idea. You know what I mean? Or, you know, Pop-Tarts. You mentioned Pop-Tarts earlier. I remember when Pop-Tarts came out. It was like we were running in the streets. Like our mind was blown, yeah. you know, just like, ah. It's like it was, it was incredible. Oh, I love them. Man, come on. I can't touch it. Now, now, bringing that up, though, like I was having a conversation with someone the other day. I remember the food growing up. Like my mom cooked a ton, but she also worked. And, and we learned to cook for ourselves because we had to. It was necessity. And I would watch Emma Lagasse and I'd just figure out, oh, Bam. And one day I cooked her focaccia. But that's a, that's a tangent. What I'm going to is at some point it was the pizza pockets and the hot pockets and the little Tostitos things and yep. the pop tarts and the this. And I would eat that. And I remember I have memories of it being good, tasty. But now as my palate has changed as who I am, the learning I've done, the way I eat now versus them, I can't imagine putting that in my mouth. Not out of judgment. But it kind of grosses me out. I love a Twix, and I'll rarely eat one now. But when I eat it, I taste chemicals. Yeah, I know it's not like what it should be. Doesn't mean I'm not going to eat it. Or an Oreo. I'll pop an Oreo here and there. 
but I could taste chemicals and I think we changed. But as a kid, to me, that was everything. That was gourmet. That was Michelin star. Yeah. But now it's like disgusting. You couldn't even feed me a Hot Pocket. You know what's so fascinating? Working, being in this field so long, and I worked at a university for a long time. You meet people from all over the world, right? And if you hear this, a lot of times when they first come to America and eat a meal, like eat fast food, they're like, this is disgusting. Like this doesn't taste like real. It doesn't taste real. Mm -hmm. It doesn't taste like real food. Like there's something not right or missing about it. But if they keep eating it, right? It's again, the addictive qualities. And suddenly it supersedes the real food, right? And it's chemically engineered to do so. But it's a consistent thread that it doesn't even taste right. It doesn't taste real Mm -hmm. if you're not exposed to these foods. And so these are largely synthetic, right? Using synthetic chemicals, additives, preservatives. And the processing is so far removed. Like that Hot Pocket, there's a shred of wheat there somewhere. But if you were to see... Enough to put it on the label. (laughs) Right, right. But it's so denatured, like it no longer resembles where it comes from. Like mm. you have no idea, you know. And so it's, this is what I'm talking about. This is not real food. And our genes, our DNA does not act, interact with this stuff very well. We evolved eating certain things with certain nutrients that were made by nature. Yeah. Right now we have a conglomeration of man-made chemicals that make up the majority of our diet. The ingredients that are making up humans now is totally different from what they were just a few decades Mm -hmm. ago. We're making ourselves out of different shit. And this is what people don't really understand. Again, if we are getting into this battle about what the best diet is and, you know, caloric management, our, every single bite of food that we eat, we're making our cells out of these foods. Mm -hmm. Every cell in my brain is made from what I'm eating. Mm -hmm. Every cell of my heart. I know the top cardiologists in the world top gastroenterologist, you know, my guy, Will Bolsowitz, Mm -hmm. you know, I know Dr. Oz, the list goes on and on. These are my guy. Yeah. Yeah. When they were in school and when they started their practice, even though they might be a heart specialist, they never considered that when they're looking at their patient's heart and their blood metrics, that they're looking at what their patient has eaten. Their, their education has divorced them from that reality. Yeah. And so now, again, we're getting in the business of treating symptoms versus understanding, like, my patient, their blood vessels, their capillaries, their blood, their heart itself is made from the food that they eat. Mm -hmm. This is not just a priority. This is a top tier thing to focus Mm -hmm. on. Because today, it's not only that we're making our organs and tissues out of really, really low quality things. It's even the fuel that all of our cells are interacting on. we got trillions of cells all talking to each other. Are they being run on Pop-Tart dust? (laughs) Right? Like highly combustible, shitty fuel Mm -hmm. or fuels that are much more sustainable and real and things that our genes have evolved with, right? And so this conversation is so much bigger but also so, so much more simple, Yeah. right? When we're getting into like, keto versus carnivore versus vegan versus are we eating real food or not like yeah. let's this is the thing that everybody can come together we can have a we are the world mm-hmm. moment with this shit you know what i'm saying lionel michael all right whatever who you want to be no, right? for sure. we can do this and unfortunately we are in fighting about minutia right and so that's another piece of this is like inviting everybody to the party being inclusive truly and providing options that feel good to everybody. Yeah. You know, and so it took, man, you know, as I was sharing before we got started, I've stepped away for, you know, over a year to work on this project. And we also were talking about this. I'm a big foodie. I love food. Any of these diets that tell you, you know, Eat to live, don't live to eat. <laughs> you know, I'm I got, I'm running. Sorry, you know? I can't. I, I don't subscribe to that. It doesn't make sense because food tastes good yeah. to make us eat it. It's it, it's how we evolved. It drives us to eat certain things, and there's this intelligence with food. Is something is this pheno- phenomenon called post ingestive feedback. Mm. So when we eat a a, re- a real food, when we eat a food. All of our cells are encoding data saying, okay, I got some copper, I got some cobalt, I got some magnesium, I got some 
um, uh, vitamin D from this. I got, you know, uh, this amount of amino acids. Mm-hmm. It's, it's labeling and, and, and creating memory on if I eat this thing, and here's the big piece, that associated flavor comes along with these nutrients. That's called post-ingestive feedback. Ooh, another new thing I learned. All right. Now, when you take that highly intelligent system and you throw a fucking Twinkie in there, all bets are off. All right. Because again, our bodies have not evolved having that substance. What does manifest again is addiction, right? Because these are geared to be highly addictive, Mm -hmm. highly palatable, and really target our brain and nervous system to make us want to eat more of those things. All right. And so it's really taking our power back. And so this practice of eating together with our family is also an opportunity to start to reprogram ourselves with higher quality information, right? To create intelligence, to turn that intelligence on where our bodies start to seek out Mm -hmm. things that are health affirming and start to reject and avoid things that are health detracting, Mm -hmm. right? It's not that they don't exist or that we can't dabble in them, right? But it's, it's shifting to a state where being healthy and feeling good and eating real food is normalized. Whereas today Mm -hmm. it's far from the norm. Wow. Um, I'm just, all the things that I'm thinking about here, sometimes I'm thinking about inside, how am I resonating with how I operate on a daily day? And I always say everything's about moderation. And I say, if you want to eat the cookie, make it or go to a really high end place that's using high quality materials it's still a cookie there's still sugar there's still butter but like eat the good stuff no matter what you brought up twinkie and i'm like twinkies are disgusting do you remember when they disappeared off the planet and the whole world went in chaos i was like thank you no twinkies we don't need this right now so i thought it was the greatest thing and obviously they made a comeback but there are times when you're talking about this intelligent system and cognition around this and feeling there is a point where if you're eating really clean and healthy for a long time that's all you crave you put something nasty in your tongue might like it but you feel bad so when we start realizing what the kind of feeling bad that we have normalized is as an actual feeling bad and we're like yo today i'm gonna eat a buffet and i'm gonna drink a lot and i'll probably feel bad for two days and then i'll get back on it that shouldn't be our everyday thing Mm. but there's times where my body's like i need a salad I just need a boatload of veggies. Like most people are craving. I need the Snickers. I need the sugar. I need the this. I need the that. Cause, cause that's what we're programmed to do. And that's the, that's the information that I haven't put one and two together. Of like you're training your body. It's really putting it in there. And now it's getting hooked on it. I'm like, I like X, Y, and Z and that's it. Don't feed me anything else. It's going to reject it. But the whole coding of making our systems and knowing this, like our DNA is the code, but we feed it the material it prints from. So if we're printing on shitty fuel, let's take a car. It takes 92. Are you going to put 87 or diesel on this thing? It's going to be a problem. It's going to be a problem. But why do we do it to ourselves? And we only have one car for the rest of our life. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You know, it's so interesting also that you mentioned cookies because, you know, there's a couple cookie recipes in, in my book. And, you know, it's just, again, upgrading the ingredients because that's really the bridge for me to come in and have a family who's used to eating a lot of ultra processed foods. And I'm just like, you can't have cookies and I need you to have this green juice. Like, it's going to be a problem. Yeah. All right. That, that bridge is going to be like a, a bridge that Vin Diesel is doing some wild shit on. <laughs> all right. Like that bridge is going to be dangerous. All right. Now. With that being said, what I did personally when I transformed my own health, living in Ferguson, Missouri, surrounded by dysfunction and people just struggling, just like, again, it was a a very volatile environment. My change, food was a bridge for me. Food was a a bridge for me to transform my body from the inside out, my Mm -hmm. thinking from the inside out. I didn't know that I would start to have a shift in my mindset as a result of what I was eating. And so with cookies being on the menu, we upgrade the ingredients, right? We start to add in higher quality. So it might be like an almond butter cookie. Or one of the recipes was something that my son Jordan just randomly made a couple of years ago, my oldest son. He just took some organic peanut butter, 
and made some cookies with it. There's a couple of other ingredients and they were fire. I'm just mm-hmm. like, bro, like, but also my son could cook. And this is another really cool thing is that we're passing on these habits and also passing on creativity. Yeah. Nobody's saying that that cookie is the, the very, you know, healthiest thing in the world. But for this kid to put together, to make something out of what would appear to be nothing that could address, you know, a craving or whatever the case might be using higher quality ingredients than crumble or whatever the fuck mm-hmm. people are eating right now. Um, and no disrespect, I don't know. I've never had a, a crumble. Yeah. And some people are like, oh, shit, I need to get a crumble, you know. Um, but what we can do is, number one, upgrade the ingredients and also imbue these things into our family culture mm-hmm. where our kids start to learn how to do this stuff. And so, you know, there's 100 recipes that we've worked on over the years, and deliciousness is a primary driving force. So number one, deliciousness. Or not, everything is number one, all right? Deliciousness, simplicity. I'm sorry, but these recipe books that we have in like 37 ingredients, like that's that's too much. What about when they say prep time, 30 minutes, and 90 minutes later, you're still <laughs> cooking? Like, come on. Yeah, that's, you know, we got to be authentic too in yeah. the preparation time. But for me, it's also, oh, that's another really cool part of the book is I really dove in and used science back tactics you know how I do it, man. I weave it in into mm-hmm, the content. Mm-hmm. There's over 250 scientific references in this cookbook. This has never been done before. And so when I'm sharing with you to create a vibe that you love in the kitchen, I'm using science. It's a science back thing. If you're going in the kitchen and you don't want to be there, right, or you're going in the kitchen and you're just annoyed with everybody. Like some people like to cook alone. Mm-hmm. It's their safe space. It's their time to, to think or to listen to music or to dance. Some people love cooking with their family mm-hmm. and their friends. Now, I would urge one of the things that I would, ch- is, you know, when people ask, like, would you change anything? There are very few things because, of course, like, there's lessons from everything. But I would take my kids up more often on their asking to help in the kitchen, right? I had to catch myself yeah. because, again, you're just trying to, like, maybe stuff is busy. And my son would come in like, Dad, can I, can I help? Or yeah. like, No, not today, bud, right? I would go back on some of those times, but now I'm aware of it, right? And so now my kids have a basic skill set, and even my older son is really advanced. Like he's the top chef in our family now. Nice to be able to feed themselves and to feed other people and to yeah. feed eventually their own families. This is a valuable skill. I'm not going to say it's the most valuable skill, but it is up there on the list. Because, again, food is creating our reality. It's creating mm-hmm. every cell in our bodies. It matters. It's how we're experiencing this life. And so, you know, we really dove in on that. The simplicity, the deliciousness, simplicity. And also, uh, another really important faculty is tying in the benefits that the ingredients bring. Mm. Earlier, you said the mind-blowing emoji. Mm-hmm. In the, I used emoji culture in the book. So there's emojis associated. I'm sharing about 40 of these science-backed foods, right? These particular ingredients that I then use for the recipes later on. And each of them is associated with a certain emoji based on the specific metabolic benefit, right? So it could be geared towards weight loss. It could Mm -hmm. be, and again, I use the science to affirm it. I'll share the studies there. Could be towards cognitive function and brain health. It could be towards improving your sleep quality, right? And so you can choose more intentionally Mm-hmm. what you're eating and what recipes you're eating based on the results that you want, right? And I thought that that was really cool. And like another re- thing... Reduce anxiety, reduce depression. Because yes. foods are triggering all these things. Yeah. You know, one of the things in talking to you and, and seeing the stuff, it's... We have a mental health crisis. We all know the, the coronary artery disease, diabetes, obesity. It's all over the... Like, we know that stuff. We choose just to ignore it. What's not being put in the forefront is the mental health crisis that's happening as a whole. But, dude, we're feeding it, too. We're feeding it with the foods we eat. We're eating things like, I know if I eat a certain thing, I'm going to be depressed and sit lethargic on the couch or or whatever the case is. So that's really cool to be able to put in foods that are like, hey, if you're failing down right now, this will give you energy. This will boost you up. What do you need? And the yeah. other thing, when you were talking about now your friend, uh, your son is the chef and putting him in there, and it, it gives them tools, right? I had this other conversation with another guest 
And we're talking about like the loneliness epidemic. You know how to help make friends? Make food. Mm. Come bring them over for a barbecue. Like you could even learn to cook. This just popped in my head. Knock on your neighbor. Yo, I made this. You want some? I have extra. That's a good way to make a friend. Like, so now you're giving your son or we give our children tools to be more social, yeah. be more outgoing, be more confident just by that. And again, food's a great unifier. So yeah. that right there is an extra little byproduct. Facts. Absolutely. You know, and so some of those foods, like you just mentioned, the anxiety and depression can be uh, exacerbated by our, our diet choices, but they can mm -hmm. also be improved upon. And so, you know, we share a bunch of those foods that, again, validated in peer reviewed studies to be supportive of reducing anxiety, reducing uh, ADHD, the list goes on and on. But, you know, and also again, you wanna think about your audience, right? So for me, my youngest son loves breakfast food. Like it's his jam, a lot of people do, right? And so he loves pancakes. And so I was like, what can we do to, we've got these sweet potato pancakes in the mm. book, oh my God, There's, it's incredible, man. The things that obviously sweet potatoes are having a moment. They've been around forever, but just being able to be creative and to use foods that have an underlying deliciousness, and you know, to create something really special. And also, again, when I was testing, and I also worked with you know a really amazing uh, chef along the way too, and we were testing things and going back and forth and really dialing in. How do we make a pancake out of sweet potatoes? It's like, it's like a legit experience, like a flavor party and being able to share that with everybody, you know? And so just to share a couple of things, like for example, even something as simple as walnuts. And we know, for example, there's, there's some really great research on the, you know, people know about omega-3s, for example, but these are plant-based omega-3s versus animal-based mm -hmm. omega-3s. So they're, they're not really functioning in the brain like we think when it comes to the plant source of these. But what's really interesting about walnuts is that they have compounds that have been found to help to break down amyloid plaque in the brain, right? So they're kind of like coming in and scrubbing. And if you also, if you want to get into like the doctrine of signatures type, you know, science where Essentially, that science is saying everything in nature will tell you, will inform you what it's good for in the human body based on the way it looks, how it tastes, how it functions in nature. And walnuts look like a brain. You yeah. Know? Like they blatantly look like a brain. So do pecans. It's the brain nut. So it's probably going to be beneficial for your brain. And now we just got modern day science to validate mm -hmm. those benefits. So number one, it does. Oh, wow. There's some researchers out of UCLA that, you know, I cited one of these studies in the book, uh, looking at turmeric, right? So mm -hmm. this spice, this is having a moment as well, been used for thousands of years. Yeah. But number one, turmeric is well noted to be an anti-inflammatory, yep. natural anti-inflammatory. Mm -hmm. But also, these researchers found that this can actually improve your working memory, right? So utilizing turmeric more often can improve your cognitive function, right? So it's like truly like a whole body benefit and the question is like, how am I going to get this in? Well, we've got an incredible, my favorite curry mm. is in the book, or you can make a turmeric latte. Right? Turmeric lattes are money. Yeah. I have a question on turmeric though, because in the up and coming, I've used it and I've studied and looked stuff up and I've come across data saying most of the spices that you see on the racks are actually old. They're not as potent. There's not as good or as quality. Have you found that to be true? And then where can we actually go find the freshest stuff? Because I think I came across something that said, like the turmeric that's in India, and they like get it straight there and cook, is next level compared to like what's on the shelf that may have been there for I don't know how long. All right, full disclosure, my mother-in-law, she's from Kenya, and she goes to like these different markets. She's like, you know, where there's like eels swimming, you know what I'm saying? Or like there's like a glass thing with, frogs and whatnot you know uh -huh. like she'll go to these like foreign markets in st louis and get certain ingredients and uh, also get stuff from from back home for her in kenya uh -huh. and yes there is even with something like goji berries for example they're they're they've been hot out on the streets yeah. back when i was in ferguson missouri you know like 20 years ago and i found out about goji berries and i of course i'm very i was a unicorn at that point uh -huh. they didn't just have them at the store so i was like going to this, you know, Chinese market 
and you know or ordering them from like the Benton School of Medicine or something like that but you know there is a different level of intention that goes into it oftentimes and like mm -hmm. when I was going because the place that I went it was in University City in in St. Louis and it was a acupuncturist um place mm -hmm, right mm -hmm. and they also had like places where you can get these herbs the and things herbs, like that the whole like that thing you picture in a movie yeah yep that's exactly right yeah. and I wasn't going there. I didn't really know what was up with the acupuncture. I just, only thing I knew about acupuncture, I saw Steven Seagal do it in some movie. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and uh, that was all I knew about. It. I just came there for the goji berries. Yeah. But so the quality is still, but here's the bottom line with even what I'm saying, it's still going to depend on the integrity of the person. Yeah. That's always. All right. And same thing with businesses. It doesn't mean you can't get the very best stuff at a conventional grocery store. I would encourage people, and this could be down the line of priorities, but to, to start to do a little research and to align yourself with companies that have integrity that you can, you know, today we've been so bombarded with these nameless, faceless entities feeding us. There is now movement to get closer to where our food is coming from. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's just like problems are, they're like two sides of the same coin with solutions. Right. And so it's spurred about this new movement. And so that's something I'm very passionate about. Some things I talk about on my show as well. Like, I only talk about things that I've like validated. I know I know the people, right? Yeah. And so with that being said, with when it comes to spices, spices are just in another category similar to things like teas and mm -hmm. just food overall. It's still going to be dependent upon the company themselves. It's not necessarily going to say, even with, the, yes, there are certain checks and balances that are basics like getting organic spices, for example. That would probably be a good idea because these plants can be so littered with pesticides and like one of them is chlorpyrifos has been cut up in red tape, proven to cause birth defects, um, proven to cause one of the, you know, the craziest thing about this is that it's been known for like 20 years that it causes all these problems. So birth defects, miscarriages and women who are growing the food and yet it's still in our food supply, right? And one of the most contaminated crops with chlor Clopyrifos is coffee, mm. right? And so I saw your face like it's like a happiness, but also like a concern at the same time. It was like a because there's also a mold concern with coffee, and like yeah. it depends where you're getting it from. So the same yeah. thing, you know. So there's certain things like taking getting organic is definitely uh, a, a good step. And in the book, I really made it a priority to demystify whether or not organic really matters in these certain contexts. Because listen, some of my friends will be out here and they'll tell you about the, the dirty dozen and the, you know. Yeah, there's a website you could check and yeah. like bananas, you don't need to get organic because of the, the thick skin on right. it. And berries, obviously, they're soft. And, and it provides some insurance, at least for comfortability for our mm -hmm. choices. But here's the, I'm just gonna be honest, okay. If the foods are grown using pesticides, they're integrated into the, the tissue matrix of the plant. Yeah. Okay. You can't wash it off. It's integrated into the makeup yeah, of the plant. Yeah, those special soaps they give you? Uh-uh. Don't I'm matter. just saying, I mean, listen. No, no, yeah. I'm just, this is, this is just reality. And with that said, when you eat a plant, when you eat any food, you're taking on that food's microbiome as well. All right. The microbiome is having a moment right now. And we're essentially, our microbiome is being created from our interactions with food and our environment at, at all times. Mm -hmm. And when you eat a food, you're eating that food's microbiome. You're taking on a part of that. So a blueberry has its own microbiome that you're taking on. This microbiome from that blueberry can be riddled with abnormal chemistry because it's grown in soils that are drenched in pesticides. Blueberries are not the size of a baseball. <laughs> right. <laughs> Things are different now, man. Yeah. They're different out here. And, you know, so it's just being more cognizant of this. I don't want to, I've worked for a long time to try to reduce neurosis in the culture because I've been so neurotic over the years. Like, I, I mean, I've you know, been there. You got to go through that phase, I think. I've it's a been phase. there, nutrition versus <laughs> diet, right? I think people use those words incorrectly, but you know, I was heavy in a CrossFit and then the zone diet was taught. So to me, it was like blocks, blocks, blocks. And I got so neurotic about it. Like if yeah. I didn't eat in blocks, so I get that. And then, you know, my wife consumes all this stuff. I actually have this thing I want to show you. I don't know if you've seen the reel where 
the guy's eating. You can't eat anything anymore. It's like, boom, 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 spits it out. Oatmeal, oh, spits it out. Oh, the water spits it out. He's just like, I guess I'll starve. Yeah, I'm going to be a breatharian. Yeah. But the, bre- the, the air is fucked up. Yeah, there yeah. are people that swear this one... I saw this. Someone shared that they just live off of breath. Listen, I'm like, come on. Hey, anything's possible, yeah. but that's not probable. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? He's probably low key eating dominoes. No offense. Um, but, you know, even with that being said, you know, we want to get to a place where there was a time not that long ago where we just ate food. Yeah. Now we're eating with all of these psychological measurements and metrics. And that time when people just ate food, we were far healthier. Now, this would bring up the conversation of, well, we're living longer today. And I've, the past year, I've really been working a lot of content. A lot of people have now replicated or been sharing what I shared in, in the beginning because I went back and looked at the data. Mm-hmm. No, we're not living longer. We are the first generation in recent recorded human history that is not going to outlive the generation before us. That is reversed. And this is just about 20 years ago where this trend switched, which is a paradox because we should be living longer now because of all of our innovations, the the drugs Mm -hmm. and therapies and whatever. And by the way, this is, you know, there's a little, if you could see me on the video, I'm smiling about it because we know, you know, the whole drug conversation is a different thing. But on paper, we should be living longer. But there's a paradox Mm -hmm. where our life expectancy is now reversing, right? Even though we're seemingly more advanced and wealthier than we've ever been, we're sicker than we've ever been. Yeah. The CDC's report from this year, six out of 10 Americans have at least one chronic disease now. Six out of 10. That's 60, per- let's just call it 60%. Like 40% have two or more chronic diseases now. We have, we're knocking on the door within the next, and this is again, NIH, CDC, and again, I'm not showing favors to these guys but I'm using their own data. Within the next seven years, we're going to hit 50% obesity in the United States. The last published data were right around 43%. Obesity, not overweight, because if we bring overweight and obese together, we're at 75, getting close to 80% of mm-hmm. our citizens. Something is extremely gone awry, yeah. all right? And now, so these are just, and I can go on and on, 130 million Americans now have diabetes or prediabetes. About 60% of our citizens have some degree of heart disease. This is all published data. How do we, how do we reverse this, right? How do we create a, how do we create a culture of wellness when the entire culture today is one of sickness? Mm -hmm. If you're healthy, if your family is healthy, you are abnormal. You are not normal in our world today. Yeah. But this is where change starts. It starts in your own household, with your own family. It Mm -hmm. starts with you. It's what you can control. Yes, control the controllables, right? We can't, I've done it, trying to save the world, you will end up burying yourself, right? Start with you, right? We hear these things, Gandhi, be the change you want. No, for real, start Mm -hmm. with you. Start with your family. Create a new culture of wellness in your family. And what happens, here's what happens. When you go anywhere, you bring your culture with you. Mm -hmm. When people see you, they see what's possible. When people see my family, they see what's possible. That's why I'm doing this. Lead by example. There's no other way. If you were preaching all this and you were sitting here overweight, not even obese, let's just say overweight, there's a big difference. You know, when I was doing personal training, at some point I became a manager of, of this gym. And the first thing I did, and I was really young, I became, I, was, I think it was like 20. I, this is how I paid my way through school. And I fired all the overweight trainers. I'm like, you can't. I, I, you probably couldn't do that now. I probably would have gotten sued or who knows, HR or whatever. But how do you expect someone to want to be you, be healthier, be everything? I think you have to be walking the walk of everything you do. I can't paint love and be a raging a-hole. Mm. I just can't. It's not possible. I could have a moment. I'm human. We're fallible. But that can't be who I am when people meet me. Like, I'm that guy. I have to be that 24-7. But I own it. I embody it. I have no problem being that. And you do that in everything. And to circle all this back, it's it's not about scaring people. This isn't fear. You're not trying to petrify people into something because you know that's not going to work. Usually that's going to drive us to eat even more of this stuff. 
But how do we start making the most loving choices? How do we start choosing love? It's uncomfortable. Uh, now we bring it all through, right? And you start with controlling you, your culture, your family, your everything, and really taking the framework of what you've just said is important. You choose, you start with you. Put your kids into it. You know, make sure your wife's in it. Then your extended family, then your friends, and then move from there. Because we can't cure the world's problems, but we can cure our little little silo, little part of the world here and start doing that. Yeah, absolutely. I love that, man. You know, like you just said, just being the representation of love. And you just said it too. You can have your moments. Yeah. You're human. And, you know, for people to acknowledge like when we're in process, right? And so when that person, maybe you're not at the ideal place that you want to be, but you're in process. Mm -hmm. And again, you, you, you're not doing things, quote, perfectly, but you're progressing, it's right? It's a journey. That's where the magic really is, you know? And so even being a representation of that, like, People don't know where you are on your journey, right? Mm -hmm. But wherever you are, you can add value. You can add perspective. You can add mm -hmm. light. And so that's really what it's all about is starting to, again, starting from the inside out. And my mission while I'm still here is to see health normalized in our culture. I know it's possible. I know it's, pro I know it's yeah. possible. I've seen things that I've created changed culture. You know, my first book, Sleep Smarter, came out around 2015. These publishers were not trying to hear like sleep wellness. Like they're like, you'd be really great with this kind of book or this or that. No. And look at it now. It was the first sleep wellness book to become an international bestseller. That's yeah. why they were just looking at the numbers. Like these books don't typically do well. And mm -hmm. I know a lot of authors who've written books related to sleep prior but it changed the culture. Since then, many sleep-related re books have come mm -hmm. out, and I can see in the culture many people, certain bars that I created, and they've become a part of the culture, mm -hmm. right? And so I know that it's possible, and that's what this, the Eat Smarter Family Cookbook is really about, is providing that template, you know, providing a model and creating a, an environment or a culture of love and connection and community and all under the umbrella of delicious food. Like, yeah. what's better than that? No, it's food is either our medicine or our poison. You decide. It's the same thing. It's food. It's what we're bringing in. But I love that you're saying culture. Like, one of the through lines of the mission here is, like, we're creating a culture of love. And how you're showing up in the world by educating people through cookbooks, through your books, through the data and the science. This isn't you coming up here all bravo and saying, look, this is what I'm saying. You're like, no, from this journal, from that journal, from this stuff. Uh, these guys have become my friends. Like, you eat, breathe, and walk, and sleep it. So, like, that's kudos to you for having no ego in the game because that's another way to make it palatable. But the one thing that, that, that you also said is, like, how do we create this culture of wellness? And... The thought around wellness right now, and all of it, like red light therapy, all these high-end recovery centers, high-end food, this and that, it's, it's wealth. I'm not rich enough. I'm not affluent. Like, you came from lower means. Like, how do we start saying that wellness doesn't mean you've got to be rich? You know, what's the through line on that, too? Yeah. Well, so this is, I'm so grateful for this. I was not grateful at the time, you know, living really in poverty, living in Ferguson, Missouri. My mattress was on the floor, mm. you know what I'm saying? I didn't, what, box spring wet, you know, my, my, I had two small kids as well and they slept on an air mattress, mm. you know what I'm saying? And But even as I'm saying this, there's a smile on my face because I'm grateful that I had a mattress, right? I'm grateful that I had a place for my kids to stay yeah. because I come from circumstances where sometimes, you know, I slept on the floor with my mom for a certain time period, you know, when I would come, I would live with my grandmother for a while and then I come sleep on the floor and there's like mouse traps and roaches and all this stuff. And so I, yeah, I come from this environment and I'm telling you everything changed when I understood that I have power, I have agency over my choices. Yes. And the biggest shift happened when I took responsibility for my life, mm -hmm. for my choices, for my circumstances. I stopped blaming everybody else, not to say that the conditions don't require change. Absolutely, we need to target providing access yeah. 
But even with that, even when I say stuff like that, it's like access to healthcare. What kind of healthcare? <laughs> exactly. The healthcare is keeping people sick and disempowered. We're not talking about the band aids. We need access to things that actually create health, right? Things that actually create wellness and empowerment. Mm -hmm. And so, but being in those circumstances and for me to, to take responsibility for my choices and to say, I choose to be healthy. I choose to find a solution. I was struggling. I was in chronic pain. I was in all these medications and that's all that I knew. You know, I was just trying to get by and I kept seeking out and asking people for help, asking these different physicians, like, you know, like, can you, can you cure me? Can you help me from yeah. this degenerative spinal condition? You know, I had two ruptured discs and, you know, they gave me the same bill of goods. You know, I'm sorry. Use it. Well, I mean, fortunately, because I was so young, they were like, you know, in a few years, yeah. right? But they said, I'm sorry, son. This is something that just happens, mm. right? And that's abandoning basic laws of physics, <laughs> right? Just like... There's causality out here in the streets, all right? And so I'm seeing the result of something, right? And I didn't, this wasn't, I wasn't born like this. Mm -hmm. Something happened along the way, but this degeneration, this manifestation of arthritis was years in the making. Yeah. Now, when I say, when I say I was eating almost 90% of my diet was ultra processed foods, I'm not exaggerating at all, okay? I didn't eat a salad till I was 25, bro. Like, <laughs> fact, seriously, you know what I'm saying? Because I picked up these eating habits from my environment. Yeah. And, you know, even when I was at that apartment, like one of my go to meals, if I didn't have even $2 just to go to like Jack in the Box or, you know, get the two for 99 tacos, uh -huh. if I didn't even have $2, I eat a box of macaroni and cheese. That would be my meal. And I put a little pepper in, a little, a sprinkle a little paprika, you know, try mm -hmm. to make it like. Put a little, that's like <laughs> cup of noodles with some hot sauce, make it yours. Try and make it into yeah. something, right? You know, but so, I, but I was making my tissues out of these things. I didn't understand yeah. until I saw the data later, which, you know, I even referenced some of this in my last couple of books, but certain key nutrients are required in order to properly build and hydrate your intervertebral disc, mm -hmm. right? So they're non-vascular, by the way. So blood flow doesn't necessarily get directly there. Mm -hmm. I need to really provide my body with an abundance. This one of the, what I'm trying to say is, this is one of the first places to degenerate and one of the last places to get nutrition. Yeah. So if I'm lacking in nutrition. Low blood flow to those areas too. So healing and. Exactly. And so, for example, if I'm deficient in, we'll say, calcium, which you would think is hard to do in this world. Everything but, says calcium fortified <laughs> or whatever. Yeah. Right. My body is going to, and this is clinically proven, it's going to pull, because it's going to use resources available, it's going to pull calcium from my spine and my hips first. And by the way, I broke my hip at track practice, okay? Who does that? Because my bones were so brittle. 78-year-old, maybe? Right, I'm saying. <laughs> and so I was 15 when this happened, right? And so my body was just robbing Peter to pay Paul kind of thing. It's, it's taking the nutrients. Mm -hmm. It's a hierarchy of needs. It needs to clot my blood with that calcium, right? It needs to fill in the blank, it's going to take where it has availability and other parts are going to be sacrificed. Now, when I started to f just literally flood my body with all of these raw materials that it needed to rebuild my tissues, man, I got better so mm. fast, so quickly. And it wasn't just the food, of course, it's the recovery. It's the real restoration. Yeah. This is before social media. So I had time to, to rest. And even when I was resting, I was actually resting, right? I didn't have my face buried in something all the time. And Couldn't binge Netflix at, at this time. It right. was one show. I'm like, oh, I got to wait till next week. I had a couple of DVDs. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? I had like uh, Nothing to Lose with Martin Lawrence and Tim Robbins. You uh -huh. know, I watched that a lot, yeah. you know? But other than that, I was reading. You know, I was still in college at the time. Thankfully, I was barely hanging on by a thread because of the pain I was in. Mm -hmm. But I just shifted my course and... Here's what happened. This is just going back to your point, too. I was going to the university gym, and one of the worst things you can do if you're dealing with a health condition is to do nothing. Every time for months when I see a new doctor, they prescribe me bed rest. I walked into their office. I was in pain because of sciatic pain, but I could still walk, and they kept telling me not to do anything. So not only is my hips and spine atrophying, everything is. Mm -hmm. So I went to the gym once I had this revelation to take responsibility 
And I just did what I could. I started on a stationary bike, which was painful. I started to walk a little bit. A couple weeks later, I started to like mess around with some weights, you know, but I came across a study. And here's the thing, what your attention is focused on will start to manifest, will start mm. to see it. Because these solutions were there the whole time. I just wasn't attuned to them. Yeah. And it was a study where it was an animal study and they were giving these animals all these supplements to try to increase their bone density. And it, it did, it did. But when they walked the animals and supplemented their diet, the bone density went dramatically higher. So that exercise, that's what the, and I'm, I'm also mm -hmm. worth wanting to reframe exercise too, because we see it in this vanilla, like get fit kind of thing. Yeah. Your, your genes expect you to move in order to assimilate nutrients, mm -hmm. in order to eliminate waste products. You know, your lymphatic system doesn't move unless you do. Mm -hmm. And so by coupling that with all of these real food nu nutrients, the movement and resting, man, like, and here's what happened. I was going to the gym and a friend of my, a, a, a guy that I went to high school with, his sister went to the university I was going to. And she came up to me and she was like, I mean, her eyes were kind of big. She was like, what did you do? She was like looking me up and down. I was like, what are you on? Like, what's up with you, you know? And she was like, you look so good mm -hmm. because she saw me a year earlier, mm. right? And I was 30, maybe 40 pounds overweight. I was puffy. I looked like a ghost. When I see those pictures of myself, I, I, it looks like I'm not there. I'm not in that body, mm -hmm. you know? But I was in there. I was just like locked away like um, the Scarlet Witch or something. Shout out to Dr. Strange yeah. too. All right, a little reference. Yeah. All right. Now, when she saw me, she asked me, like, can you help me to, to, to do what you did? Can you help me to get in shape? And I was like, absolutely. You know, just, you know, we want to meet on like, you know, Thursday or whatever. She, she was like, how much should I pay you? Time stopped. Yeah. Because I was like, she wants to pay me for something I just do. Right. And here's the, this, that's when my path, mm -hmm. right. My career was created because my physical presence attracted this moment and the work that I'd done with myself. And I found a way to be of service to others and mm. also doing something I would have done for free. And I largely did. I was like, this is also a true story. It's kind of messed up. I was like, uh, seven dollars. <laughs> I, I was like, like seven dollars. Happy meal. Because that was like a job, you know, like a fast food job at the time. Yeah. Like that would be like seven dollars an hour. So, but it wasn't. It wasn't even about that. It was about man. I I was on fire to help her to win to find a solution for herself. Because what ended up happening eventually, I opened my practice and worked as a nutritionist for many years. So many people came in with the same story that I that I was fed, which was you're not helpable. This condition that you have, this is who you are now. And that was so far from the truth. Yeah. And so I started to help people to deconstruct these conditions, mm -hmm. right? So diabetes. Diabetes is your body making an adaptation under unideal circumstances to keep you alive. There's abnormal amounts of blood glucose mm -hmm. that can literally kill you. So your body is going to create adaptations to tuck this stuff away, creative ways to keep you alive. So you resist. And by you being alive, hopefully, you'll be able to sort it out and, and, and do what you need to do. But unfortunately, we, we believe that this is, this is my lot in life. This is my story. That label, this is who I am. And I'm telling you, if your heart is beating, progress is possible. No, it's so many people in authority. They're doing the best they can, too, in the moment. Like, everyone's doing the best they can. But, like, just because you have a white lab coat doesn't mean that's the only answer. It's an answer, but it's not the answer. So that's no, a beautiful story. Thank you for bringing that together. A uh, couple other questions here. But uh, you were a manifestation of what you were seeking to heal yourself. And that win-win was she saw you, validated everything you did, set you ablaze of your path. And then you saw, like, this is how I'm in service to humanity. But you had to be in service to yourself first. Yeah. And you not listen it. to what the world said. But two, two stories. I'm born in L.A. This is my normal. I am very blessed and very grateful for being here. I knew what a salad was my entire life. As soon as I became an artist and was able to travel across the world, you know, I found myself in Memphis. I found myself in Mississippi. 
I couldn't find a, a salad for the life of me. Do you know what a salad was? It was the, the decor at the buffet that was what all the trays were lined up on. We were trying to find some healthy food, and, and we finally found a Walmart, and I found some baby carrots. Not to say I don't eat burgers and stuff, but it's like I saw the reality. I was mind blown because to me, it was L.A., New York, Miami, Austin. Like I was siloed. I did travel the world and see other things, and you expect some of these things in other countries. But you hit middle America, and you're just like, what the fuck? Mind blown. Like There was a few times I, the project I did was a mural in Clarksdale, Mississippi, but I brought two buddies to paint with me. Like we were sitting there crying. I painted this mural about goals and dreams. And I taught these kids that we can all dream, but once we write it down, it becomes a goal. It becomes attainable. You hold us accountable. So within the mural, they painted all their goals, all their dreams and made them goals. And that project was around fiscal literacy, but also just driving through all that. It was check cashing places because credit and poverty, that's a whole nother, whole nother animal. And these places are criminal. They take 40 cents of every dollar and you're like, I need my whole dollar. So that's a problem. But then all you saw was like fried chicken and then dollar stores. And that was it. And look, I love fried chicken, but you can't eat that every day. So I saw this. I've experienced it. So being in the silo of L.A., the only thing I'm really saying is like I urge people to travel, go see the world, go see America. Go see and be grateful for what you have and where you are and what knowledge you have. And sometimes even us over here in L.A. that take this for granted, we have all the good stuff, yet we're still making ourselves sick because we're not seeking the knowledge with, when we have more access to the opportunity. Yeah. Right? When I was going to describe Ferguson earlier, I was going to like detail like, okay, fast food place, fast food place, convenience store, check cashing place fast food place fast food chinese restaurant but it's not like good chinese yeah food. It's, it's msg like, and oil yeah it's like bulletproof glass you know what i mean yeah. and um you know that was it's it's again it's a culture that keeps us in that same culture yeah. right and y yes i did decide and to see my agency and my power and and this was tying into food if you get this like this is a game changer i made myself the top investment right so yeah me driving to brentwood which was the neighborhood where the only whole foods was in st louis by the way mm -hmm. all right there's one whole foods in la like lit i could throw a rock and hit a Dude, whole there's foods. three around us right now okay four if you count 365 not normal bro like there's one whole foods all right when i when i made this transformation there's like three when i moved mm -hmm. Um, which, whoa, big progress. Um, and then and St. Louis, by the way, is a big city. This is a legit big city. Mm -hmm. And yes, I was paying for the gas. I was leaving my environment of, of comfort and familiarity, and I was paying more initially. Mm -hmm. But as I was investing in my food, I started to feel better. I started to have more energy. I started to become more creative. I started to make more money. Yeah. And eventually, I started to see more opportunities to keep doing this. And so I, I started to find out about farmer's markets. And I started to save more money. Mm -hmm. And I started to invest in myself. And I started to create these relationships. And within a short amount of time, within a matter of years, a lot of the places that I was buying food from was now giving me food for free. All right? So today, that's my life. If people could, when people come to my house, bring a grocery bag. Shout out to... DJ Khaled, bring a grocery bag. What time's people, dinner, Sean? What time's dinner? We have people go into my pantry. Like I've got, they go in there and go shopping mm -hmm. because my friends and colleagues, my, these all these incredible food related companies, they give me all this stuff yeah. that I would gladly pay for. But it started with me investing in myself. Yeah. I didn't know that was possible, right? So mm -hmm. those goji berries that I was like hustling, trying to get and find, mm -hmm. eventually this company, I had goji berries on tap. Yeah. All right. And this is this is 15, 20 years ago. All right. So part of that change is and that story of coming from those conditions is having the audacity to invest in yourself, invest in yourself because it's going to pay you mm -hmm. back far bigger dividends. Not only will life find a way to make these things affordable, mm -hmm. you're going to probably start performing at a higher level. 
And you're probably going to start to have more access to resources because it's not just about money. It's abundance of everything around yeah. you. The most valuable thing in my life, which I would have never known because I come from like my father who just passed away. He didn't mess with a lot of people. And I, I took on that quality. Mm -hmm. All right. He would have one friend maybe at a time. Right. Just a drinking buddy. Right. And that's it. He don't mess with people. So I had this lone wolf complex. That's part of my suffering. And it took me time to start to open up and to trust. And the greatest, I would have never thought this to be true. My greatest resource today is my relationships. By far. Mm -hmm. It's not even close. Anything that I could imagine needing to do or to get done, it's just a call away. It's a text away. I mean, I would have never again thought this was my life. And this is what's possible. When people, lots of people say this, you know, like if I could do it, anybody could do it. Yeah. A lot of times it's still like, I don't know. Yeah. But like for real, you do not, you do not want to take my path. You do not want to come from where I come from. And truly in the conditions that I've come from to be here, because I didn't just do it. I learned all these lessons and have been mm -hmm. sharing and teaching along the way. And People have access to all of that for free. Yeah. All you got to do is push play on an episode on your phone. Yeah. If you want to spend a couple of dollars, all you do is pick up a book. You get the whole thing right there. It's, it's, it's the map. It's a blueprint. Mm -hmm. But here's the, the last part is that you got to do something with it. You have you to know? take action. And I think that the secret sauce, and to bring this all back to food, is you know, finding joy in it. You know, Finding that connective tissue. Stop trying to force yourself or even hate yourself or punish yourself into feeling good, yeah. into wellness, into health, into fitness. Find a way to align yourself with more joy. Find something that feels good. And even with that, give yourself permission to experience that and feel mm. that joy. Because permission. so often we think that suffering is required. We've been inundated that suffering is required, mm -hmm. you know, giving yourself permission to feel good, give yourself permission to experience that joy and that love and that connection because you deserve it. You are worthy. You're worthy. Right there. You said it. Wrap that up in a boat, invest in yourself. That's self-love and that's proper selfishness. You've got to be selfish to love yourself, to give yourself all these things to take agency, to own it, to choose it and experience it. And we don't need to suffer. It shouldn't be a chore to be healthy. I know it looks like one, especially some, some people's mountains look like Everest. Some people look like a speed bump, but we can do it. Thank you so much. That, that, was, that was a sermon on everything. And take it all back. The one thing to do right now, it is so simple. Eat with your family three times a week. Three times, you can do that. Saturday, Sunday is easy. Make all three one day, baby. I don't know if, I don't know <laughs> if that counts. Way to do but it. Like, yeah. Yeah. Three times a week, eat with your family, and then go. We think that it has to be this crazy, giant obstacle, but like, eat with your family. All right, I'm gonna, I need to cook a recipe out of that. So, Sean, thank you. There's one thing you said, and then we've got the final final question. But you said that there is a direct correlation and relationship with the food you eat and how you express or receive love. Yeah. What, what is the specific block there? Because I think that's the first time I read anything like that and thought to myself, like, wow, I could see that's why one of we have one of the major inhibitors here. Yeah. One of the consistent best-selling books is The Five Love Languages. Mm -hmm. And people having the revelation that people give and receive love in different ways. Yep. And part of the conflict in a lot of relationships is that people express love in one way, and their partner doesn't really receive love in that particular way, and it's mm -hmm. a mismatch. And so the author is encouraging us to understand our partner's love language, understand ours, and start to speak to people and, and connect with people through their love language. And hopefully, it, it's returned in your language, mm -hmm. right? 
But also, we don't have just one love language. We all experience all of them. Yeah, and it's seasonal and moods. and. But food fits together deliciously in the different love languages, you know, whether it's acts of service, right? So when my wife gave birth to my youngest son, my mother-in-law made a bunch of food and brought it over to our house, you know? It's just something, again, it's like Harambe, it's part of Kenyan culture. But for us, like, especially for me, because I didn't really experience that, like, from other things that I was exposed to growing up, he's like, you have a baby, you're on your own, you know? And, you know, her doing that, it was an act of service. It was her expression of love, mm -hmm. right? It's her, it's also gift giving, mm -hmm. right? So that's the way that my mother-in-law expresses her love. She might not be the most like touchy feely person, but she loves you and you'll tell when you bite into that food, mm. right? Yeah. And you know, the same thing holds true even with um, affection, right? So that's another love language is touch, okay? Eating something, yeah. You know, what touches us closer than the food that we're eating literally down the soft yep. through the yeah all right now we can get to the sexy stuff all right that is but food literally becomes a part of you mm -hmm. all right so we're literally taking something from the outside environment and making it a part of our human tissue matrix that is crazy yeah that's physical touch so that love language which tends to be a love language for a lot of men from the relationship context and, and seeking that physical touch, food fits into that as well. And so again, just making those similarities, food fits into the love languages, you know, whether it's again, acts of service, physical touch, giving gifts, mm -hmm. you know. Cause and you, you also give in service, you give the food, you receive the food, you get touched by the food. Yeah, never thought about that. Yeah. They say what, the weight of the man's heart it's through his stomach. I mean, so whoever said that, I mean, head of their time. I, yeah, I, I hope they at least got like a gift certificate Some or something, you know. Royalty on a t shirt. <laughs> yeah, so I tie in all of those as well mm -hmm. to the five love languages in the book. Pretty much everything that we've touched on today is melded together in a really beautiful format mm -hmm. in, in the Eat Smarter Cookbook. And right now, this is actually this moment right here. I'm, I'm, I'm beginning this. Th there's a big movement, but this right here, this is the initial seed. Mm. And so I'm grateful to sit here with you to do this under the the umbrella of love, truly, you know? And one of the things that I wanted to do, because, you know, with books like this, you want it to become a movement. Yeah. And, you know, I'm scheduled to do all the, 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 the usual stuff, you know, the Good Morning Americas, the... You know, cool, you know, things I really want to do, like yeah. sway in the morning, stuff like yeah. that. But n n the most important thing is really creating community, right? And fostering community, sharing your story, making the food, taking the action step you just shared, mm -hmm. eating together with your family three times a week, like really approachable things that we all can do. And so no matter where I'm at speaking about this, it will not be like this moment. You know, this is really special, man. Mm. And um, one of the things that I wanted to do for everybody to celebrate the release of this book that I've, again, put a lot into is we're doing, this is my first time talking about this, we're doing a family health and fitness summit. And so that's going to be going down in October 2023. And this is this is the beginning of what's to be an annual event. And so it's, to me, it's just like crazy this has never been done before. And the great thing, my relationships, so this is a virtual event that people can attend from anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. We've got Layla Ali, undefeated world champion, boxing champion, mm -hmm. you know, and father Muhammad Ali, obviously. But what people don't know about Layla, oh, she's about that life when it comes to food. She won the cooking show Chopped twice. Damn. I've had the opportunity many times to eat with Layla. Oh, some of the best times in my life. She's going to be one of the speakers at the event. Mm -hmm. And you're going to get to learn, like, how does she create a culture of health and wellness in her family? She's the she's probably the busiest person that I've ever met. And she still makes dinner for her family most days a week. I'm just like, what is... All right, so Layla Ali, we've got Gabby Reese, we've got Dr. Will Bolsowitz, the gastroenterologist that I mentioned mm -hmm. before, gut expert. But he's got kids. Every That's the prerequisite. Like, they're really about their life. They found a way to create a culture of 
Health of the Family, Dr. Daniel Amen. The list goes on and on, and people get access to that for free when they pre-order the book. Oh, amazing. And that's at eatsmartercookbook.com, eatsmartercookbook.com. Pre-order the book. The event is $297, and people get access to it for free. All right, so this is just for the pre-order. So when you pre-order the book, that's what you get access to as well as a bonus. That's just, by the way, that's just one of the bonuses. So we're really hooking people up with things that help to really create a culture of wellness, mm -hmm. more resources, more education, and a lot more fun as yeah. well. No, oh, beautiful. Thank you for that. I hope everyone takes you up on that because at the end of the day, when we're in it with a lot of us, Guess what? If you're going to go commiserate, be a victim, and have all those stories, you're going to find the people doing that. Now, why don't we go find the people that are championing their life, and let's go, what's the opposite of commiserate? But the same thing, pool with these people and yeah. conspire to eat better, do better, love better, be better. So that's a beautiful thing. Yeah. Thank you, Sean. Absolutely. Thank Final you. question. No right answer. It's just your answer. How do you define living a life through love? It's easy. That's easy for me. It's, and this is also one of the things that is most attractive to me and other people is being someone who expresses congruency, mm -hmm. being someone who walks and lives their word, your, your, your thoughts, your word, and your actions are in alignment. Mm -hmm. We need so much more of this today because a lot of, especially today with social media and things can appear a certain way. Yes. To be somebody who is truly, and also even the word authenticity, like marketers can screw that up. You know what oh, I mean? Yeah. Like, it'd be a more authentic. And then you like, it's a thing. It's like a marketing tactic or something. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But really just having the audacity to keep your word, to be about what you say. Yes, you can make mistakes. You apologize and you get back to being about your word. Yes. So living in alignment, because when you're in alignment, you don't have to hide, you don't have to operate from fear. Love is just on tap, mm -hmm. because you're not hiding from the world. So that's what it would be for me. Boom, mic drop. Amazing, Sean, thank you so much for being here, dropping the science, you, your story, sharing your heart, and where can everybody find you? Easy, where they're listening to this epic show, they can find my show as well. It's called The Model Health Show. Uh, anywhere you get your podcasts. And my home online is themodelhealthshow.com. And I'm at Sean Model, S-H-A-W-N Model on Instagram and Twitter. I tweet every now and then, but Instagram is, you know, pretty popping. But, um, you know, most importantly, eatsmartercookbook.com is uh, where you get all the good stuff in the new cookbook. You would also access to the Family Health and Wellness Summit. Amazing. Take advantage, everyone. We'll have all the links everywhere we put this all out. And uh, I'll see you for dinner in about two hours. Yeah. Man, I'm hungry already. Let's go. Thank you so much for tuning in to Live Through Love. If you love this episode, you'll love this episode.